Welcome to the conversation today, Conversations and Connections with a friend of mine, Dr. Linda Reed. I'm so excited that you're here with us today, Linda. I can't wait to introduce you and share with the audience who you are, what you're doing, and what God has been up to in your life. Um, so thank you so much for this time that you were giving to, to me and to the audience today. I feel Linda. really honored to be invited. Thank you. Yeah, it's exciting. So I'm just going to share a little bit about Linda, and then Linda's going to talk a little bit of our family, and we will get into some of our questions today, because we have a lot to cover. Um, yes. So Linda, yes. Um, so you grew up in a, uh, with parents who knew what it was to speak another language and immigrate to another country, which is a large basis for what you have ended up accomplishing in your mm -hmm. life so far. Um, and since your time of education at Biola for your BA, University of Texas for your master's in linguistics and ESL, you've traveled extensively to a variety of places and nations around the world. Um, you love internationals and you love teaching. And I know because I was your student and we'll get into that later. Um, you are a conference speaker and professor at Heritage College and Seminary and a wife to Rick Reed, who was recently the chancellor of Heritage. We'll talk about more of the changes there too. Um, and you were passionate about the globe and everybody that is in the globe. You just have such a heart for that. And I've heard so many beautiful stories from you. Um, you graduated in 2017 with a doctorate in education and you continue to develop programs and teens who teach English and ESL and TESL in Canada. You are certified here in Canada for that. And you also have your Ontario theater theory instructor as well as a Canadian language benchmark certification. So you have just continued <laughs> to build. I mean, it's just extensive, but I had to share it because your life, you are a lifelong learner. And that is one thing that you definitely inspired in me was that you just never can know enough and you never stop learning. And the knowledge is so vast and beautiful, especially when it comes to biblical theology and doctrines and understanding all the narrative patches, passages and teaching passages the Bible offers. You just opened up a whole world for me when I stepped into that classroom at Heritage. So mm. welcome again. And so I know I gave the extensive one, but maybe you can fill us in a little bit about you and your family today. Mm. Well, I, I just want to clarify, I love to read. And my dad growing up was a dairy farmer, and he always taught us to read the historical markers, to know uh, about things. So I do think it's great as women to keep our minds learning and growing to those markers to honor people that came before us. This week, I, I, I'm i studying the book of Hebrews, but I'm also, I read the story of the history of Coca-Cola in Canada. And wow. I just, I'm just a gracious reader because you just never know when that yeah. conversation and is going to relate to someone that you meet and and I'm just very interested in things yes. so that I think yeah. is is uh, contributes to it um yeah. I want to just add one thing um we lived in, in I was born in Washington state I did my education in California met my husband in Texas we served two churches in California and it was during the Canadian ice storm of 1998 that my husband and I flew into Canada for the first time uh, for him to interview for the position of pastor at the Met in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. It was really mm -hmm. bad there in Ottawa. So he smilingly said, just smile at the people. This will never happen. But uh, 25 years later, we have enjoyed being in Canada. He's been uh, the pastor at the Met, president of Heritage, and that opened a lot of doors for me to keep yes. learning. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Tell us a little bit about your family. Um, just currently your role as a grandmother. Ah, <laughs> I have three uh, children, two, two sons. Uh, surprisingly to me, they both are headed towards ministry in, in different ways mm -hmm. different than we are, but uh, in their own context. And I have a daughter who serves uh, as a palliative care social worker in a hospital in Ottawa. So I have three kids. They're they're great. They're all grown in their 30s. And I have five grandchildren so far, uh, mostly boys. And they wow. all so that's great. And then a little granddaughter, one of one of those. Wow. That's amazing. I love to hear that. I love to see your your uh, face shine when you talk about <laughs> your grandkids. And um, uh -huh. it really is beautiful. So you have to travel though to see them because they're not all here, are they? Yeah, the boys are in Boston. And I, I will say we get a physical workout when we're there. I, my <laughs> husband and I have just taught our oldest grandson to play baseball and he can hit the ball. And, <laughs> and then we're running and tagging. And so I come home pretty exhausted. But yes. it's, it, it again takes me into another world and, and I'm enjoying that. 
but that's who you are. You travel and you're willing to go. And that's what mm. makes you so incredible. You're so open to those opportunities. Wow. So, yeah. So I know I mentioned that we met at Heritage College and Seminary. Um, I took the uh, the graduate program for women in ministry. So maybe just before we get into a little bit of your background, why don't you talk a little bit about, um, just because we're on this topic of heritage. So tell us how heritage became a part of your life and how you ended up in this teaching role. Oh, uh, so Rick was at the Met for almost 15 years, just a couple months shy of 15 years. And uh, one night he just got a phone call uh, to, and I, as a pastor's wife at different churches, I always know when these pivotal moments come mm-hmm. in your life and he sits you down and says, I just got a call from, and uh, you know, these calls come and sometimes you just blow it yeah. off. He said, uh, I just got a call from Heritage to become the president. And I said, well, that's, I knew love and respect. And so I said, oh, that is such an honor that you would be asked, but I don't, I don't want to move there yeah, um, no. because I knew it would blow up our family and, and right. Ottawa. Um, and uh, so he became the president and then I was here and I, I just thought I could uh, help. And this relates to going back my own training, the, the Met sent me to study at Western Seminary as I was writing curriculum for the Met mm-hmm. for women's studies and for the whole church. Rick and I were writing together and, and I didn't really know what I was doing. So I, yeah. uh, the Met so graciously paid for and sent me to go to Western Seminary where they had a center for women in ministry uh, with Beverly Hislop, who had the very first program for women in a seminary context. Mm-hmm. And I just talked with her one day and said, how did you get to do this? And and I had already my master's and I thought, you know, this would be fun to see mm-hmm. Canada have something that equips women better for ministry as well as encourages women as they meet each other uh, to serve in ministry and so I wanted both those components the equipping and the encouraging and so we began to develop classes I think the first class was women in ministry and leadership with Bev Hislop from Western uh, developing Bible study curriculum brought in Phyllis Bennett from Portland Mm -hmm. women teaching God's word and women reaching God's world with evangelism, which if you know me, I love. Yes. And then women in church history with Dr. Haken. So those are the five classes. And I guess I drew from relationships I knew and mm-hmm. all across North America. And then when I did do my doctoral studies, I interviewed 12 women leading programs around the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I drove and met with them, interviewed. And um, mm-hmm. so I've just Recently, this week, had Terry Stovall come in from Southwestern, just people I met at other schools that are now teaching with me. I mm-hmm. Most of these classes now I am teaching or coordinating, but drawing on the wisdom right. that I've been taught to teach to someone else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. I remember that first class, the scripture um, for the curriculum writing. Oh, and, that's powerful. Um, yes, that was incredible because that was such a passion of mine anyway. So it's so neat how I was able to take that one first. And I'll I'll never forget how we just, we dove right in to these passages and we just, we are lighting up our pages with different colors and all these different techniques and how we're able to instantly take all of the backgrounds that we all had and apply it and then discuss it. And it was just this magnetic moment where I was just like, okay, I'm stuck. This is it. This, This is exactly where I am supposed to be. So right from the beginning. You just brought in the essence of this coursework to really nurture and grow us and develop us and to remind us that we we aren't alone and that there's all these different women that yes. are thinking these same things. And then you meet them and go, you were thinking that too, because I didn't even know about this program until I heard that my niece had been attending the school and that God laid it on my heart that I was supposed to be doing something academic, which was very strange because it was not something I ever thought I would do. Um, But meeting you was inspirational and such an encouragement because you really helped guide me just into studying and knowing more and learning more. And I know that you've done that for so many women. And then you said, and just wait, you're going to meet so many different women and you will keep connecting with them. And that's exactly what has happened. In fact, I just was texting someone this morning, um, Rachel, and we're going to meet halfway. We have a little halfway point to meet for coffee. I find that people do make usually one special friend or another. Yeah. Uh, 
a, a student that's driving out to the list to well area to meet with two women. Yeah. Once a month. So, yeah. 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 So, no, it's wonderful. So let's get into the background um, of you. Just tell us a little bit about your family context and how that influenced you in your faith journey. My parents uh, came to faith when I was around two years old and they were, I guess, um, so I grew up in a Dutch town. I'm Dutch completely. Um, and everybody was from more of the Dutch traditional churches, which if you're Dutch, you know what those are. And my parents became born again believers and were baptized, which resulted in real troubles for them. And um, but they were so excited about being born again that they were just leading many people to Christ. And mm -hmm. on the radio, when I was three years old, I heard the gospel over the radio and I was sitting in my high chair evidently. And I said, I want to accept Jesus into my heart. And that is my earliest memory of life. Wow. And yeah. um, I then was surrounded by scripture. My dad was a farmer and he would just simply read the scripture, the next chapter mm -hmm. in a, a book of the Bible every night at dinner and stick the daily and put read the daily bread. Mm -hmm. And I the Lord that I was washed with scripture from an early age. I was had to memorize a hundred verses a year to go to camp. So wow. I learned a lot of scripture and I'm thankful, very thankful for those foundations that were uh, yeah. laid in my life and things like sewing our clothes and gardening and cooking and so many beautiful things. But underneath all of this and hidden away, um, there was pain and mm. it came in in various areas and we learned to be perfect on sunday and to mm. kind of keep these things quiet mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of those areas i'm going to only highlight one was a very near to me i had a relative that was severely mentally ill and the story is actually published in a book called one brick at a time if this mm. ministers to you you might look up one brick at a time getting over the bitterness of mm. aim and this really affected my family. And I, I was often told as a young person, you will be mentally ill. Really? And wow. So for me, actually, it kind of, it's scary. And mm -hmm. I really felt like I need to cling to God. You know, I'm, yes. this could happen to me. What's, what's yes. happened to this relative and, and we all could watch it. And, mm -hmm. and so I just really learn to cling to God. And I guess I want to say to the listener out there who has hidden pain as well, maybe something you've kept a secret, you know, at, at Heritage, probably the knocks on my door of college students or even um, is a knock, knock, knock. Can I talk to you? And uh, I find that pain recycled, re reworked by God is such a rich compost for helping yeah. us well, matter of fact, I think your deepest ministry, probably mm -hmm. my deepest ministry and being at girls' weddings and talking to them about being married has come from really being part of their lives and their pain and yeah. letting our pain. I, I have a, a little children's book, uh, When God Makes Scribbles Beautiful. Mm, that's beautiful. Scribbles in our lives and he makes them beautiful and lets us be used by him to help yeah. others. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that context of your willingness to answer the knock at the door open up quick like because you know you're busy working right that happens when you're in your office so you just you take that time and mm -hmm. I know how life-giving it is when somebody takes time for you just to listen to you offer you a word of encouragement and to pray for you and that's just a natural thing that you and Rick both have um, that you have extended to so many countless people and that is such a ministry that you have um, and I was spe speaking of the pivotal time. Do you feel like there was a pivotal time in your life where your faith was really challenged? So I'm, I brought up that to kind of lead to this. In 1992, I, I was in my mid-30s and somehow caught a virus that was uh, deadly. I didn't realize it. And I struggled. I had three little kids in three years. And I was doing my best and I kept sinking lower and lower and lower. And I do remember the day they carried me out of my home um, and watching my three kids huddle together in the corner crying. It was a, a terrible feeling. So and it brought up some of that. And I, I was laying on my bed and the doctor would come in and out at the hospital and he would say, she's got to fight. She's not fighting. And at the same time, I was in a depression and and because of the trauma, it was handled very badly at the hospital. I had all the wrong medications. They were 
cutting off the leg of the person in my roommate. It was just a horrible experience. Oh. I sort of got uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and I learned yeah. like anxiety and depression where you're just, your body is involuntarily shaking. And uh, I think through that, I actually went to a precept conference and I had the word of God in second Timothy. And it just was like endure hardship, endure hardship. But I realized through that, well, for one thing, precept, the love of scripture, circling words and looking at God's word. But I really came out of that thinking, now I have to take God so seriously. This yeah. is this is a make or break time. I'm either going right. to go into that place that I've always been told I could go, or I'm going to be like that tree in Psalm 1 or Jeremiah 17 that extends mm -hmm. it by a stream yeah. and I'm strong when the storms come and I really, really devoted myself. I would memorize scripture. I also want to speak to the person struggling with anxiety. Anxiety will trap you in and in and in. You become afraid of this and afraid of that. And until I became almost afraid to leave my house as well. Yeah. And then it's just like, I have to push against this. So I would put fighter verses with scripture in my pocket and I'd say, this week, I'm just going to go to the grocery store and back. Right. Next week, I'm going to the grocery store and I'm going to go to small group and and I'm going yeah. to go here and there. And and Rick held up a dress during that time. And he said, Linda, I believe when you come through this time, someday you will speak to women all over the world. And I uh, thought it's not like, right. you yeah. know, I'm not a speaker <laughs> now. And yeah. but I just am amazed how how I had to cling to God. And I guess yeah. if you're out there and you're you're struggling with something, I'm asking you. Have you deeply spent time in God's word? Sign yeah. up for a preset Bible study or sign up for definitely a Bible study with somebody because it's so easy right now to spend all our time on our phone mm -hmm. and just to get ourselves more yeah. and more shaken up as we watch the world news. And as we have yeah. so many fears, like it's a desperate time. Get yeah. yourself deeply embedded in the word of God. Yeah. I think actually when I was just listening yesterday to somebody say, Here's the one thing I can tell you today to help you get through these anxious and depressed times. And she just said, do not worry about tomorrow or tomorrow yeah. will worry about itself. And she said, if you can remember that, just like what you're saying, what is that next thing right in front of you? Yes. I was actually just talking about this with my sisters just the other day. We have a Marco Polo video that we talk back and forth and it's been so life giving. And it was just the reminder of okay, here's what I'm doing next. I'm not going to think about five days from now because that's going to no. overwhelm me. This is what I'm going to do right now. This is how I'm going to pray for my family right now. And I think when you talk about this whole concept of the depression and um, anxiety, I think when when you spoke um, back in June to a group yes. of women in Oakville, yes. um, it was, I don't think people realized what they were walking into and how much <laughs> they needed to hear. And just like you talked about the pain of your story and how God has transformed it so that other people go, I, I didn't even know I needed to hear that, but now I know I need to. And now what is my next step? So why don't you, if you want to just talk a little bit about that time, because I think it was overwhelming and surprising for a lot of different women that day. <laughs> um, and I'm sure your repercussions keep on going. They do. Um, yes. But yeah. I I wouldn't doubt if I'll be contacted by somebody off this podcast, particularly if you're Dutch. There's something about our culture, too, that I think um, we're like those big houses in Amsterdam. We have a beautiful front and behind that be mice running around and, and a lot of pain. Um, I knew the question. I was on a panel at Radiant and it was, how do you minister to somebody who's struggling with mental illness was the official question. And mm -hmm. it went down the panel and my heart just began to pound because <laughs> it's very no, easy as, as a Bible study leader to think, oh, let's push that person away. Or I can't right. disciple somebody with mental illness. Oh, they right. belong in a, and, and when I was struggling in 1992, uh, a little woman, I don't even know if she makes five feet tall. She had been a pastor's wife. And she said, I feel called by God to come alongside of you. Hmm. And we, we would just walk around the lake. And then she began to disciple me. And she said, Linda, you've got to take every thought captive and make yeah. every thought you think. And mental illness is opposed by mental wellness. Yeah. And by taking mm -hmm. scripture and saying, is my thought right now obedient to what the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ 
want me to think. And so I shared this at Radiant and I have, I have never, out. I was out in the lobby, I would have lines of people to talk to me. And, and what I'm saying about this is I think it's something that needs to be talked about in our yeah, church. I agree. And, and read my cousin's book or talk with me in a group or call me to talk to your whole church because I don't know how many individuals I can have in my home. Yeah. But uh, this is a huge topic. I think many people are struggling with it. So do yeah. not think you're alone. But it, it's time to uh, assess our thoughts, to mm -hmm. bury yourselves in the word of God and cling to, yeah. to one another. But you can also, like a drowning person can drown somebody else. You don't want to drown somebody else. Yeah. You're going to have to walk worthy of the Lord on your own two yeah. feet. But you will need some yeah. people to come alongside yeah, absolutely. And I think that what the enemy, he is out to steal and kill and destroy. Yes. And he wants to take away the community of God. He wants the church to become little isolated pockets where there isn't accountability and the, the place to share and to be open and vulnerable. And the most important thing is to pray. And I think because of what we are experiencing in our world and there, there it's just, it's hard. It's just hard. You can't open up your phone or turn on the news without feeling overwhelmed, which can spiral really quickly. And, and I think that if we can do exactly what you're encouraging us to do, to combat the enemy through prayer and to be prayer warriors together, acknowledging the difficulty that we're on, because you can't deny what is happening in your own family context or what happened in your past, but allowing God to use it for his good, for his glory and in his way. And you can't rush it. That's, that's the one thing we want to be fixed. It's quick fix. Yeah. And you can acknowledge just yourself going back to even 1992. That wasn't overnight. It is a process of mm -hmm. overcoming. And Plus years. Your, yeah. And so I, that's what I appreciate so much about you is that you do the way that you have lived your life. You just are encouraging that you're never fully complete. You are a work in progress. God is always working on you. But at the same time, he's giving you victory and you get to share that. And that is such a gift. Yeah, I, I, I do think, yeah, it is a process. I, I guess I want to be encouraging for the woman out there. I, because of the drasticness of some of the situations and yeah. um, I have gone for counseling a, mm -hmm. a few times and mm -hmm. I, it's not been years and years uh, for a short time in 92, I had to use some medication. I guess I yeah. want to acknowledge that mm -hmm. um, I felt like I was sliding down a well and yeah. I, couldn't care for my kids and I couldn't I was so traumatized by everything plus uh all of it came up I said to my husband it's like it's coming up the heater vents in the basement you know and uh -huh. I'm flooded with uh, uh -huh. the, the pain of the past and I needed to do to process that so I would encourage you if you really need to to seek out a godly Christian hopefully biblical uh -huh. counselor someone that will take you to the word of God, someone that will also help you see, mm, I could repeat these patterns. This is all sure. I know. Yeah, and that's so, true. You know, yeah. like, how do I change so yeah. that I don't do this, the very same patterns um, yeah. to my children, to my husband? How do yeah. I build, how do I let my words be an encouragement? Yeah. And it's interesting you, you talk about that because it really is a choice that you have to make. And mm -hmm. Nobody can force you into it, but you can listen to the wisdom of other people. But really, you just need to think about the fact what is going to benefit you and your family and beyond, and then being ready to share your story one day to encourage somebody else, because that's what he wants us to do, to encourage one another and to build each other up. And there are days where I might be more capable. And then there's days where somebody else is more capable helping me when I'm walking through a hard time. Well, the one thing I do know about you, Linda, is that you are always on the move. You're always writing, creating, speaking, doing. And I know that's amazing. And it's how God has built you, which is such a blessing. So I have a feeling there's something coming up. There's lots of dreams and hopes that you have um, that maybe were planted a long time ago, or that maybe they're new. So let's talk about what is next for you. Hmm. Um, I am excited about some things for the future today. And I am doing on my own a Jen Wilkins study on the book of Hebrews. 
uh, just because I thought I got to do the most difficult thing that I ever could think of doing. And by <laughs> myself, it couldn't be more difficult. But um, I am thinking of teaching some things from Hebrews at some women's retreats next spring. So okay. if you work online, uh, you'll see something with Faith Mission Canada. And I, I think I had an invitation this morning, just some speaking things. I want to talk about the whole area of not shrinking back, holding fast, mm -hmm. and let us run the race that is before us. So so that's one thing. A second thing I'm really passionate about and thinking about writing on, mm -hmm. don't stay my topic here, is the whole area. I'm hearing this in every sermon, every book, identity, identity, yes. identity. And so I started to look this up in the Bible like a good person. And identity, the word is not once in scripture, in about all the major 10 versions. And so I'm very concerned that we are picking up the world's verbiage mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. the biblical ver verbiage, which is we are made in the image of God, mm. male yeah. and female in the image of God. What does it mean to be an image bearer? What, instead of thinking of our identity, how I think with that sort of, we get to pick it. I choose my identity. Right. Right. Um, the other way um, you think of the old hymn, a stamp thine image in its place. Like mm. we are already stamped. We're already programmed. Ephesians 2, 10 created for good works that God has foreordained for us to do. Right. And I think yeah. that we need to flip this a little bit. And I, if I could, yeah. and I had the ability and the brain power to, to attack such a mm -hmm. huge issue in our culture, I would write more on the image of God versus the identity that we're even using right. as Christians identity in Christ. Well, yeah. that's never once in the Bible. Very so interesting. Those are, those are a couple of big topics I'm interested in. Yeah, definitely. Um, how about for you and Rick together? Um, are there any projects that the two of you are working on? Because I know if you go to their site, which I will link, you have so many resources and books and eBooks. Um, and a lot are actually free um, for download and on marriage and your all of these different topics it's amazing so i will i will definitely um note it in the notes for people to check out but is there anything that the two of you are doing together uh yes we are right now rick is the interim pastor at grandview uh church in kitchener ontario and you can listen to him as a podcast he is moving through the book of first thessalonians okay. and i am um uh, Wow, I'm just loving to hear him consistently. He speaks all over, but right now he's doing a series. Yeah. And I'd like to think about him as the next Swindoll, you know, just a, a great yeah. preacher. And yeah. so we're doing that. But surprisingly, and I haven't talked about this too much since our change from heritage, mm -hmm. we are looking to get him more involved in uh, an initiative called the Open Toronto Initiative, which involves reaching the unreached in Toronto mm -hmm. and in Canada. Okay. And um, promoting something possibly through an organization called ABWE and being involved with other missional leaders. Like what can we do to across Canada, mm -hmm. reach unreached people groups and Toronto has the most unreached people of any city in the whole world. That uh, I did not know. It yes. doesn't, does, it doesn't, it kind of surprises me and it doesn't surprise me, but yes. that's an incredible so, statistic. You don't need to go overseas anymore. And no. another life I have is I'm a TESOL teacher, an ESL teacher, and I am now currently training churches. So if I could help your church to start an ESL program, um, I'll do that. Not even through Heritage, just come to your church and talk about it. How can we um, reach people that are right in our neighborhoods? Yeah. I could tell amazing stories, Sandy, and I'm going to just tell one here. I'm involved. I would love to hear a story. I was going to ask you to tell one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm involved with a, a girl from one of the closed, most closed. I mean, if she becomes a Christian, it's life threatening. And I'm involved with her. It's a little scary for me. It's a little scary for her. I've said, please don't ever say where, where I live. And yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm involved right now with 10, 10 plus 12 international women that I'm teaching mm -hmm. English on, on Thursdays. And they're from the most unreached countries, Japan, mm -hmm. Middle East, very, very close countries. And we can mm -hmm. reach unreached by just teaching English. And I've gone more to using grammar lessons, using scripture. For example, mm -hmm. Psalm 23 is all in the simple present tense. Mm -hmm. uh, he makes me lie down. He leads me beside still water. Whereas Psalm 40 is the past tense. I waited patiently for the Lord. So yeah, just, just being where you are, loving your next door neighbor. Yeah. You don't have to have an amazing call to do something. Bring a plate of cookies to a neighbor yeah. and say hi. Yeah. And 
God will use us. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And you, uh, through the courses that we were able to take at Heritage, you definitely were reminding us of that, especially in the evangelism course and just being able to go out into the neighborhood and knock on the door and say, how can we help you? Is yes. there anything that we can help you with? Do you need whatever it is? And talking about how Heritage is around the corner and there's students that can do different things. Um, it, it does. And it's scary. It's taking a leap of faith because people will say no and they will shut the door in your face. And, um, and you had us, you know, come to your home and you just, the, how you have just modeled this hospitality of inviting people in for a meal and sharing a conversation um, and letting God lead the conversation, being prepared to know what to say, but not directing the conversation, letting the Holy Spirit direct the conversation. You have no idea where that conversation is going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know, you may need to cut this, but you cannot believe as I just was at a place called Adam House in Toronto this summer, there are refugees and immigrants that on the night they arrive in at Pearson Airport, they have nowhere to go that night. And they are beautiful women and they are ending up homeless and on the streets and in very compromising situations, not because they want to, but because no. our our housing fees are so high right now. Right. And if obviously they don't have a job. And yeah. What is happening on the underground here in Canada is, mm. oh, and again, this pulls at some of my story and I just mm. care so much and so deeply yeah. that immigrants yeah. would have where to go and no one to love them and no yeah. one to take them. And, and that I think really goes against the Old Testament, loving the stranger, showing hospitality. You never know yeah. when it might be angels unaware. Yes, that verse, <laughs> that verse would rock me when I was little. I just... I, I thought about it. That's probably one of the verses actually that impacted me the most as a young person, just I'm trying to understand what that meant and looking for it <laughs> and thinking about what does that really mean in my life and how am I caring for people um, immediately? And I, and I saw that through my family growing up in my heritage, just my parents opening up their doors constantly and neighbors and people over. And it was in, in here until when we moved from BC to Ontario, the same type of thing. Um, and I see that in your life and what you and Rick do as a couple is really beautiful. And the impact really, I don't think you'll ever know the full impact of what the two of you have been able to do and what you will continue to do. Um, so before we finish off today, um, there are a lot of women probably watching. And there's probably some young women and some maybe even some younger men, older men. I don't know. But is there a word of encouragement that you can share with somebody who's in a season where they're just struggling with almost like, what is next? I, I don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing or what is my, what is this next season going to look like? And how would you encourage somebody um, who's feeling like that today? Hmm. I, I guess um, God has built into my heart a, a tremendous faith i guess that mm -hmm. uh, like william carey expect great things from god attempt great things and i think mm -hmm. one of the, my concerns about canada is we're just settling down and not really expecting god to do something incredible mm -hmm. and attempting that and i understand if you're a young mom with children ah you're great things right now the greatest thing of all is to take that child on your yeah. lap so this is not to those in that season, just being a mom, just, but think of yourself as raising the next generation of sending arrows yeah. to them. think of what that transformation of your homeschooling, if you're teaching, settle in and make mm. life changers. But right. for some of you that are not in that season, either you're single mm. at the beginning or you're, you're later in the season. I mean, why not? What has God put on your heart? Mm -hmm. And are you stepping out with him to go visit something like Adam House or get involved in the yeah. open? Are you believing God can do something incredible? I just want to tell a couple more stories. I yeah, have a yeah. friend named Karen Findling. I want to highlight Karen, great woman of prayer. And a number of years ago, uh, the school heritage was quite in debt, $3.7 million in debt. And, and we began to dream of building a new building. Now, obviously, you need to erase the debt and then raise $20 million to get a new building. And, and Karen and I, I don't know for what reason, we began to walk the property at Heritage and just praying, mm -hmm. God, do anything. Nothing yeah. is too difficult for you. You yeah. can erase this debt. And God, would you put a building right, <laughs> right here? And if you drive past Heritage today, that building will will be there. The, the... God is able to 
And, and I think it's just two women out there prayer walking. We were tromping through, it was the pandemic and we were had snow boots on and we're going through this high brush, just praying, right. God, would you put a building here? Yeah. And God, would you do something in my family? God, would you yeah. use my life for your glory? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think Isaiah 40, uh, 43 says, enlarge your, your borders and and mm. go to the nations, be a light to the nations. And I just think God wants to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. I, I have this on all of my walls in our home. Everybody that comes here, I'm, I'm subliminally telling them that. Yeah. It's on yeah. two of the heritage walls at Heritage. Do mm. more than we dream or imagine. Pray for it. Go for it. Mm. Does that mean I get everything I want? No. I have some huge unanswered prayers. And so to the person like me, I was reading about Elizabeth in the Bible yesterday. They were righteous and blameless in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments, but they had no child. Mm. You know, it doesn't mean that just because you're blameless, just because you're praying, yeah. that you get everything in the timing. But it's interesting, no. Zachariah later gets the baby and said, I heard your prayer. I heard your prayer. And Rick said to me today, he probably stopped praying 20 years ago. He was an old man <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. And God said, well, I heard that. And you don't know what God's going to do. He's hearing that prayer right now. It may not yeah. happen for 20 years. Yeah. But let's, let's be women of great faith. Yes. Let's Let's renew our prayer circles and our friendships with another and just pray yeah. that God would use our lives. Yeah. And of course, if heritage can be part of your training, just helping you to be better equipped, dream for that too. You can yeah. supply the funds. You can supply, you can audit a course for, for a very low fee uh -huh. and you don't have to do the homework, but yeah. <laughs> I encourage you. Uh, where Isaiah 43, enlarge your tent, spread out to the left and right. Let your church be used by God to do yeah. something amazing in Canada. Yeah. And let's yeah. see what God will do. And then let's give him glory because yeah. I just want to finish this by saying all that's happened in my life, all that he held me, everything that's happened at Heritage and this building, it's not me. Let yeah. me not glory. Let me give the glory to praise the almighty yeah. God. But I got to see it in my lifetime and I pray that you will in yours. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, Linda. I think I just want to finish off by talking about that whole concept of prayer. And I think we go into a situation that seems overwhelming and big and we shut down. It's almost like opening up a closet that you wanted to clean for five years and you just shut it and walk away think, no, it's not really there. And you just walk away. But it's like this big situation that you have that you know you need to pray for. You need to open up that door, open up that place and just start praying. And let God do what he's going to do in his time. And like you said, there are, there are going to be unanswered prayers. And there are prayers we may never see on this side of heaven. But God knows what he's doing. And he is sovereign. And that is the encouragement I think we both want to leave with people today. Um, to don't give up. Don't stop praying. And know that there's hope because of what Jesus has done. And you and Rick are evidence of just lives fully submitted to him and willing to go where he is calling you to do and, and saying no to things that you love and saying yes to things that are a bit scary. Um, and it's a great model for us to take that leap of faith because we are the church and God has called us to be his hands and feet. Yeah. I think if you're only doing things that you can already do without God, it's not a God thing. I think you need right. to be involved in things that are way bigger than you. Yeah. And uh, the, the actual quote from Elizabeth Elliot is do the next thing. Uh, even when you are cleaning out the closet, you just have yeah. to first take out the shoes, then take out the coat. You know, everything is is just a little bite sized paces. But in 10 years from now, you cannot believe how much you will have accomplished if you work by faith on those little yeah. things. Today. Yeah. And also to celebrate when you do see that answer to prayer and be able to tell people, look what God has done. And that's kind of exactly what heritage is right now. When you see the building and it's like a city on a hill. It's just so, I love how you can see it right off the highway and um, the way that the light shines on it, like the sun at certain times of day, it's just beautiful. And it's just a reminder of look what God has done through heritage. It's really oh, beautiful. Praise him. Yeah. yeah. Praise. 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I, I'm touched by your life too, Sandy. I know you have housefuls of people too. So <laughs> I just don't want to <laughs> highlight myself, certainly you, all your neighbors and friends. And and it's been a privilege to be here. And wherever you are in, in your place right now, be faithful. Yeah, great. But um, believe God for, I, Rick and I had our lives turn around um, through the C.C. Winans album, Believe For It. Mm. And wrote it and composed it and sang it during the pandemic and I yeah. would say her life what are we believing for God for that's impossible yeah let's believe him that's amazing thank you Linda so much for your encouragement today and for your time and I can't wait to share this episode with others so that they can also be encouraged so thank you and I look forward to an in-person coffee if I can I'll make my way out to Heritage yes. and knock on your house <laughs> yeah, or your house yeah but it was great to chat with you today and I look forward to a conversation very soon thank you Linda okay thank you